Can I have you come forward? Father God, we praise you and we thank you for all that you have given to us. Lord, we set aside the month of November as a Thanksgiving celebration season. The truth of it is, is every day should be lived with thanks living. Living with thanks and praise, glory and honor to our great God and King who has given us everything we need in Christ Jesus. You so lavishly poured out all the greatest blessings of life. Lord, please take this time, this offering, Lord, out of hearts of gratitude for the furtherance of your kingdom building here, Mount Bethel. We ask this in thy name. Amen. Before I get started with my sermon this morning, we have a very important task. Linda, this is an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. It's packed to overflowing. I know that because it's bulging and it has three rubber bands on it. Okay? Which tells me that whoever created this love offering has also packed it full of a lot of prayer. But we as a local body of believers are going to pray over this box representational of representative, is that the word? English teachers? You know what I'm trying to say. This box represents the rest of them. Amen? So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pray over this box that it finds exactly where it's supposed to go. The hands of the right child in the right place at the right time so that God's mercy, grace, and love will spill out of this little box and they'll be able to see Jesus in a very real and practical way as this opens the door for what Christ wants to do in their life. Amen? Join me in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this precious ministry. Lord, we don't know where this box is going. We don't know the child that it's going to or the land that it's going to or exactly when it's going to get there, but you do. And so we trust you, Lord, with all the goodness that you have provided for us and all the goodness that the person who built these boxes individually, Lord, want to send out in your name. And so, Father God, we trust and believe that the hands that this box goes to and all the others as well will find an open heart and an ability for your Holy Spirit to minister as only you can. Thank you for all the hands, Lord, that will lay hands on this box and all the boxes that Mount Bethel send find their way into that hand so that you can make a difference in that person's life. Thank you for the blessings of Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes. And thank you for our precious friend Linda and all those precious souls here that have helped make this ministry possible. We ask this in thy name. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> you got it? Yep. All right. Thank you, Linda. You know, when you read your Bibles, it's really easy to get caught up in these amazing stories, all these amazing people, and to be caught up in the idea that somehow these people have become something more than just ordinary people. Well, they are. But there's something different about them. There's something totally different about them. Almost from cover to cover, you see these incredible stories coming to be because they made a single decision to trust God. 
Some of them were called to do amazing things, just absolutely amazing things. And when I read the stories going from book of Genesis all the way through, I find that people find themselves faced with situations and circumstances often that present themselves as giant problems. You ever had a giant problem? Mm -hmm. God knows we all have at one point or another. Did you know that faith plays a significant role in our ability to successfully deal with such and to come out victoriously on the other side? It's true. Faith is key to developing a winner's attitude. Faith that you believe that something can be accomplished in spite of what others say or what the circumstances might look like or even what obstacles, what giants might be in your way. Faith, what you believe more than anything else, is central in whether or not you're going to succeed or not. It's healthy for us to develop a positive faith, but more so than just a positive thinking. This isn't a self help book it is the self-help book amen it is the book that God says you bring yourself to me and I will help you that's the part we have to deal with but attitude is most important characteristic trait of every great achiever some years ago a famous sales expert many of you may be familiar with Zig Ziglar Coined the phrase, it's your attitude more than your aptitude that determines your altitude. Say it with me. It's your attitude more than your aptitude that determines your altitude. You believe that? Mm -hmm. He went on to say, we cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string that we have, and this string is attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me, and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. Our attitudes, it's true are contagious. Just be around somebody who's got a positive attitude and you already feel much better. Be around somebody who doesn't have a positive attitude and you can't wait to get away from them. Amen? Amen. I remember as the pastor at the campus where I was, every Sunday morning I would greet the, the folks who'd come in at the door. And it's amazing to me. I'd be shaking their hands and talking to them. And every once in a while, I'd have somebody come up and grab my hand. And they, they'd want to hug me. And, oh, pastor, pray for me. I've been sick this week. <laughs> Thanks. I wish I'd known that about 30 seconds earlier. I'd have just done one of these. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Attitudes are like that. You know, when you're around somebody who's positive and uplifting, you like to be around them, don't you? They encourage you. They make you feel good about life. You like to be around them. Even when they're saying things that challenge you, you're like, wow, but that's all right. They're motivational. When you're around somebody who's got a toxic attitude, you never say, well, that was motivational. They challenged me. You're like, oh, I can't wait to get away from them. Oof. That's heavy. Speak the truth in love, yes. But if you're speaking the truth without love, that's just a bully, Right? Attitude can change everything. You can have a great attitude and be in the worst situation and things will come through it. How do I know that? Because I'm about to share with you an amazing, very short story about somebody who had every reason, every reason to not be. It's amazing. Remember, this is the story of Dr. Viktor Frankl. He was the prisoner in one of the Nazi death camps. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he describes how he was stripped of all his worldly possessions and subjected to every cruel and debilitating treatment man is capable of imposing on another person. However, Dr. Frankel decided that regardless of what they did to him, he was going to take charge of the way he responded to those events. He wrote, one's ultimate freedom is the ability to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Man, I've learned a long, long time ago that attitude can only take you so far. 
attitude, on the other hand, can take you a lot farther and keep you there. Yes, we might find ourselves in really dire circumstances. We might find ourselves in situations of times of trouble and testing and tribulation. But how we respond to all of those things, we are completely in control of. Amen? Anybody ever been in a time where they just weren't sure what was going to happen next? Anybody ever been in a situation where they lost their job? Anybody been in a situation where they got a bad health report? Or that their spouse gave them some bad news? Their kid gave them the finger? My hand's still up. Thank you. You see, we can go through a myriad of things in life. Some of them are funny. Some of them are not. Some of them are painful. Some of them are enduring. Some of them are one of those kinds of things that you think, man, this is great. I never want it to end. And others, you wish you could get it over with right away. But how we deal with all those circumstances, how we look at life, is completely up to us. I've been teaching you since I've been here that faith and fear are opposite sides of the, of the coin. Faith is the enemy of fear and fear is the enemy of faith. Amen? What I'm about to tell you right now is, is you can say I have a good attitude but unless you put that attitude and that aptitude together you will never see the altitude you are looking for. You might be great at something but if your attitude is toxic you'll never be all that you want to be. Now, I know some of you around here are saying, well, I saw on television, they got this, this really great doctor. You know, there was a television series a while back. It was called House, and he had a really bad attitude, but he was a great doctor. Well, I'm going to give you a clue. Are you ready? That's make-believe. <laughs> because in reality, people don't want to be around somebody like that, right? It doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't fit in with the team or the culture or whatever the currently correct buzzword is today they're not going to keep you right because you disrupt the dynamics and if you're out there as a solo person trying to do your own thing and you have a bad attitude you probably won't get too many customers no matter how good you are amen so aptitude right it's got to come after right attitude attitude more than aptitude right determines your altitude are you with me? Say amen. All right. Now you're saying, well, that's Pastor, that's great. We've heard from Zig Ziglar and we've heard from another great man. All right. Now I want to share with you real quick like that. If we've learned all these things and we get this, now I want to give you a quick snippet from God's word before we get into our story. Our attitude has got to be right. Our attitude has got to be right because it reveals an awful lot about us that we may not even be aware of. God said this. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, 35, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man from his inner good treasure brings out good things and the evil man from his inner evil treasure brings out evil things. Oh, I can feel the toes curling up right now. You see, What's inside you comes out of you. And what comes out of you reveals more about you and me than sometimes we want people to see. If you want to have a good attitude, then you need to start working on putting good things in so that you can develop that good attitude. Amen? See, if there's negativity when we face adversity, challenge, obstacles, and problems or issues, what comes out is negativity. Gripes and complaining, division and discord, blaming others and making excuses. All of that is toxic. If there's positivity, then when we face adversity, challenges, obstacles and problems or issues, what comes out is positive statements with options and ideas and possibilities and solutions, recommendations and inclusiveness and unity and taking responsibility. I've said it this way before. Anybody can see the problems. It takes a special person to see the possibilities. Amen? It has to do with attitude. Attitude. If you're the kind of person who walks around and sees all the problems all the time, maybe you need to work on the attitude. 
if your problem walks around and it's bigger than your attitude, maybe your problem isn't just your attitude. Maybe it's your spirit. We read in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Maybe your spirit. If you're thinking negatively all the time and it's thinking about it and it comes out in what you say, what you think about, what you feel on will come out in your actions negatively. We find an excellent example of scripture that's going to be able to help us see this played out in real time almost as if we were there. An excellent example of how attitude more than aptitude determines one's altitude in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. In a little boy, a teenager named David. He's the youngest of his father's eight sons. Historians and theologians estimate that David was between 15 and 17 years of age at the time. And would have been about four and a half feet tall. Probably weighed somewhere less than a hundred pounds soaking wet when he confronted and killed the, the Goliath, the giant. Now, some accounts put it, Goliath was either 6 foot 9 inches tall or 9 foot 9 inches tall and weighed around 310 pounds on the smaller side of the scale or 860 pounds on the larger side of the scale. I personally lean towards the research and commentaries of others who support the smaller height and weight. But when you consider that David was somewhere around 4 and a half feet tall and he faced a giant almost 7 feet tall, David weighed less than 100 pounds and Goliath weighed around 310 pounds without all of his armor. It would have been a giant. Either way, based on the size of David and that of Goliath, there's no doubt that David faced a really big problem when he faced Goliath in battle. And it certainly sounds like David was the underdog, but was he really ever? Let's take a second look at the story. Stand with me in honor of reading God's word today. Was he ever really the underdog? Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Succo in Judah. A pitched camp at Epinis, Demon, and between Sokoth and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled the camp in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath who cut was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze sheaves and a bronze javelet was on, slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of, of Ephraim named Jesse, who was a man from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. Their firstborn Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son, David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. 
Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines and asked his brother how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his, his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. And he will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bear in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you would come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran, stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. 
Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharam road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? And Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Philistine, Abner, and took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. Wow, awesome story. Let's pray. Father God, we love you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord, that you have recorded this word in your word. This incredible story to show us, Lord, that things not are not always as they appear. And that our attitude, more than our aptitude, can change everything and determines our altitude. Open our blinded eyes that we might see, our deaf ears that we will hear, our dull minds that we might finally grasp this truth. And our hardened hearts that may not finally be receptive to it. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said. Now, I've got to tell you. That to take on this story usually is not anything like what you just heard. The take on the story is, is, oh, this poor little kid. He went out there and he fought a giant. And God miraculously gave him the victory. And he never had a chance. Well, you're not 100% right on that. If you look back through the story, you see amazing things in the story. The first of which is David was there and he already felt incensed in his spirit before he ever offered to step up. He was violated by what this man was saying. Well, now look, if you're cowering in fear, you're not going to say, oh, hey, that, somebody ought to do something about that. Notice that the rest of the Israelite army got up every morning, found their way to their battle lines, and shouted out a war cry. But they didn't do anything. That's part of the truth. Only David was the one who was willing to act. Not even his older brother who was willing to confront him for his arrogancy. But he stayed right where he was. It was David who was willing to step up and step out in faith. That's observation number one. The second observation is this. That we often see that, that, that David, you know, well, he kind of went out there with, uh, all right, I know what we're going to do here, and, and I got it. But what we don't realize in this very familiar Old Testament story, in this image that we've created about it, is that we don't always put all the facts and pieces together. How many of you have heard this story before and felt like David was the underdog going in? Come on. There you go. Some of you are like, Pastor, you just told me he wasn't, so I'm not. Come on. <laughs> it's okay. I want to show you some, some powerful truths that it is the attitude. It's your attitude that can change things. David started with an attitude of faith. According to the dictionary, attitude is a predisposition or a tendency to respond positively or negatively toward a certain idea, an object, a person, or a situation. Attitude influences your choice of action. It's very, very clear that in this story, David had a positive attitude, a faith attitude, a can-do, must-do, will-do attitude that influenced his actions. Amen? Amen. There are four major components of attitude, affect, emotions, and feelings, cognitive belief or opinions held consciously, cognitive, the cognitive, excuse me, uh, inclination for action, and evaluative, the positive or negative response or stimuli. You've got to have all those things going on positively or negatively to move. The problem with us is some of us don't. We bog down. We might say, I have faith. 
I think that somebody ought to do something about that. Yes, absolutely. Who's going to do it? We don't move to the next step. We don't move to the next step. Our faith becomes impotent. James says, show me your faith in your works. A lot of people say, I believe. I'm happy that you do. But James is also quick to say, but even the demons in hell do that, amen? They know full well who Jesus is. They know full well what he can do, what has done, and what he will yet do. But notice, they don't act in that faith. People come and say, I have faith, pastor. Great. We are not saved by works. We, we are saved by grace through faith to do good works. Amen? And we do those good works, not obligatory, not perfunctory. We do them because we are desiring to bring glory and honor to God by doing good for others and demonstrating our continued growth. Amen? David stepped out in faith. Man, I hear what you guys are doing. You're all coming out here with a war cry and lining up. Yeehaw! But you're not doing anything. David said, I'll do it. Faith. It's your attitude. Your attitude moves you forward to act. David's attitude from the beginning of the story was very different from those around him. David asked the frightened Israelite store, uh, soldier standing around what reward was going to be and how things were going to be done and who was going to defy the living, uh, uh, the, uh, the guy Goliath. Nobody stood up. Nobody said a word. King Saul heard what he was saying. Brought the boy in disbelief. He basically said to, to David, don't be ridiculous. They're a kid. You can't go out there and fight this guy. He's been fighting wars since he was a kid your age. He will kill you. David never changed his mind. He stepped up in front of everyone and said, we can do this. I can do this. How did he do that? How did he have the right attitude? Notice that David's response was that because when I was doing this with my sheep, when a lion or a bear would come, this is how I acted and this is what God would do. And God gave me the victory there. David was full of attitude. When David arrived, arrived, he heard the taunts of Goliath. He was surprised that no one else would take a stand against the giant and his insults against God's people and their God. He was outraged. And he was indignant. He was not the proud and boastful uh, uh, and arrogant of youth. This kid was full of faithful fire. I wonder sometimes. I wonder sometimes why we see less happening in the church for growth. Why we see less influence in the communities and in our schools and in our governments when we see our folks who are saying, well, I'm a believer and this is what we should do. But when it comes time to make a difference, we don't, we don't see ourselves out there taking a stand for what's right. I preached a few weeks ago, rise up, stand for what matters. Are you willing to take a stand for what matters? Even when it could cost you? David was. Even at the insistence of others. Even at the mocking of others. He was. David was full of an attitude. David wasn't a warrior and he knew it. But David had a weapon that Goliath didn't have. And that was faith. Faith in God. That faith gave him a confident assurance that God was with him and that that faith combined with confidence fostered this incredible attitude. That attitude of, he's given me the victory in the past, he'll be with me now and give it to me again. He was willing to face Goliath because he was unwilling to see the Philistine giant mock his God. Unlike the men of Israel, he fled who fled from Goliath, David ran toward Goliath. That's observation number two. Right attitude. This isn't a sit and wait and be paralyzed. Psychologists like to say that human beings have the fight or flight for survival. 
David was not afraid. He was running towards the problem. He had determined that he had the right attitude and his attitude was going to take him to do the right thing. Now, if psychologists are right and we're in a fight or flight mode, flight would have taken him the opposite direction. But that's not David. The word says that David intentionally moved toward him. Ran towards the battle lines. To approach the giant. That doesn't sound like an underdog to me, does it? To you? I'm about to tell you some things that are going to amaze you. You see, David had already, already had sized the, the enemy up. David had a right attitude because he came at God with the right attitude. God, I'm praying for wisdom, for strength, and for courage. I need to know how I can be what I need to be in you. And he would lean into God when others were not. I like what Malcolm Gladwell had to say about the commentary on this story. He said, God had already told David, this is a giant. But he's not one to be afraid of. Goliath can't see very well. You see, to start with the fact that the giant, six foot nine, Philistine warrior, he's a big guy. But big guys also have extremely big problems. He's tall. He leans into double vision and severe nearsightedness. He can't move real quickly. And while he's strong, he can't move real well. So lo and behold, in the biblical story, as Gladwell points out, Goliath has to call out to David in order to fight him. Come to me that I might Feed your flesh to the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field. Why? Because he couldn't see David from a distance. He needed to get his enemies up close. Big competitors perceived big advantages can become big disadvantages when you know the truth. Here's the takeaway. Having all the right attitudes and the right information helps bring your giants into perspective. It might look like a giant when you're right up close to it. But when you have all the right information, you soon realize like David did, Goliath wasn't a big giant warrior. Goliath was a, was a giant target he couldn't miss. How do I know that? Because the story says that David picked up five smooth stones from the creek. Why smooth? Because they travel through the air faster and they hit their target. Rough edge stones will have the, the velocity or the, the wind working against them with resistance and they're liable to go off target. So David already realized from his battles with the lion and the bear, this is how you choose the right stone. David had wisdom. You get up close to the giant, but not close enough where he can see you go real well. Just close enough where you can be lethal. Perspective has everything to do with it. But that's not all. Look here. Number two. It's your attitude more than your aptitude. That's what Zig Ziglar said. It's your attitude more than your aptitude that determines your aptitude. Aptitude is the natural ability to do something, a talent, a skill, a suitableness, or a fitness for. Goliath was powerless at a distance. David and Goliath are fighting to begin with because the Philistines proposed their, their toughest warrior could defeat Israel's warrior. And when Israel's warrior was defeated, then one would serve the other. But David, a lowly shepherd boy, he's the only person willing to fight the Philistines. David wasn't a proven warrior and he knew it. But for all of his attitude and all of his aptitude, David knew he could not approach the giant in his own strength. Couldn't do it. Attitude and aptitude would not gain the victory. David had a weapon. Goliath didn't have it. It was faith. But David had to use that faith the right way. The right attitude would secure the victory and David knew that. So, he took his five smooth stones. He took his sling. 
And he took his attitude and he ran towards the enemy. Now imagine this. You're the enemy, Goliath, and you are six foot nine inches tall, 310 pounds. And you've got all this armor going on and you've got all your cronies standing up on the hillside cheering and ranting and clapping their armor together and ranting and trying to intimidate everybody. And here out of the Israelite camp comes this scrawny little kid running towards you with no armor on. You just think that that's ridiculous. Who could possibly be absurd enough to do that? How do I know that? Because the giant responded, what, you would come at me like a dog? Throw a rock at me? David says, I come at you in the name of the Lord. God had given him wisdom to know that giants have giant problems. Giant warriors aren't giant warriors, they're giant targets. What does that mean to you and me? If you trust and lean into God, God will give you the wisdom to know how to size up that giant. It'll go from being a giant warrior to a giant target. God will give you the tools like he gave David tools to go after that giant. He'll give you the strength and the courage to do it. David was impugned with wisdom, strength, and courage and he had everything he needed in attitude and aptitude to take down his giant. All of us have aptitudes. Aptitude is that natural ability to do something but combining that with the right attitude creates an incredible opportunity to reach the altitudes we want to. Your attitude at home or school or work determines your level of success when you combine that with the aptitude. If you're not combining those things, it doesn't matter how much you try, you're not going to be doing something that's God-honoring and you'll never reach the altitude that God had for you. Third, that determines your altitude. David knew that God had given him the aptitude God had given him the right attitude. Now God was growing David's faith and giving him the right altitude. This godly perspective as he was approaching the giant was absolutely amazing. Notice that it, the scripture says it didn't take five stones to slay the giant. Notice that it didn't say that, that David had to exhaust himself. That they were out there for hours going at it. No. David realized his first best resource was God, not his last resort. Amen? He came at Goliath with wisdom. I see you. You're not a giant warrior. You're a giant target. Courage. I'm going to run at you. When everybody else is cowering, I'm going to come right at you. Strength. I got this. I have the abilities that God has given me. I know what to do. He reached into his pouch. He grabbed that one stone. As he was running, he put it in his sling. And he took that sling as he was moving toward the giant. And he said, I come at you in the name of the Lord. And he slew that giant with one smooth stone. Can you imagine the faces of the Philistines when their giant warrior fell into a giant heap? Well, I know what scripture says. It says that they fled. They panicked. And when the Israelite army, all those who were cowering moments earlier in fear, realized what was going on and that they had gained the victory. Notice I said they. Okay. They ran after them. Now, why am I telling you this? Because you see, it's your faithfulness. It's your attitude more than your aptitude and your, that determines your attitude. That's true for you as an individual. But it's also true for how you influence others. Your attitude is contagious. If you're afraid, if you're in flight mode, everybody else around you could become the same. The giants could take over and you could end up all serving them. The giants of fear. All it takes is one person to walk in there and say, no, no, this is all it takes. Faith, faith in the living God. He's given us everything we need to be victorious. And then step out in wisdom, strength, and courage and act on it. Act on that faith. 
you'll slay the giants. The Israelites won the day. David's altitude changed. He went from a lowly shepherd boy. Suddenly now everybody realized he had gained the victory. Goliath had underestimated this little man. He was never the underdog. Goliath was just a giant target. So are yours. You're not the underdog. You're a child of God. God has given you everything you need to be victorious over every situation in your life. But you've got to gain the right attitude. And that comes by faith. God had used David to prove a valuable lesson. And now everybody wanted to know who he was. His, his story would be forever changed. It's your attitude more than your aptitude that determines your altitude. Altitudes are those potential heights that can be reached above everyone else when we learn to trust God, seek His wisdom, His strength, and His courage. It's the attitude that changes everything. Everything. The takeaway for us today in closing is this. Attitude is a state of mind that is formed by our thoughts and always results in corresponding behavior. So if you want to live better, you got to develop a better attitude. If you want to change your behavior, it begins with thinking positive thoughts, good thoughts. Oh, I'm not talking about just thinking positive thoughts and doing a positive self-talk. That's part of it. Don't repeat the lies of the world, the flesh, and Satan that say you can't, you won't, you never will. Come at them with, this is what God says. I am. I will. He already has. This isn't a new idea. Paul wrote, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed through the renewing of our minds. Paul knew then, and we should too, and grasp it. To be transformed from the inside out, we have to replace old ways of thinking. Get rid of old hateful feelings and start developing new ones and then start acting on them. What's it mean for you? Hey, if you're used to waking up every morning with a grouchy attitude, go in your mirror and look at yourself and say, it's from the inside out. It's from the inside out. Whatever I got that's good on the inside will come out on the outside. Whatever I got on the inside that's not will come out on the outside. I have a choice to make today. My wife re repeated to her dad just a little while ago, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is a mantra for victory. Amen? As human beings, we have a choice. You have a choice. Sow a thought. Reap an action. Sow an action. Reap a habit. Sow a habit. Reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. That's what Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, wrote. Hey, if it's good for business, don't you think it'd be good for your personal life, your professional life, your corporate life, private life? Even a non-Christian gets this. Your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. Your values become your destiny, Mahatma Gandhi said. Truth is truth. I've taught you today that what you think about affects your attitude. Your attitude impacts the rest of your life. It's your attitude more than your aptitude that determines your altitude. Hey, at Thanksgiving time, this is an appropriate time to say this. Did you know that you can take a, an eagle and you can have it hang out with a bunch of turkeys and within a relatively short period of time, it thinks it's a turkey because that's all it's ever been treated as. Are you an eagle? Tired of hanging around turkeys? You got to get the right attitude. You got to know who you are. You got to remember what you are. Then one of these days, you got to find yourself strutting up to the roof line, stretching out your wings to put that faith into action. Amen? Well, eagle's one of my favorite animals. You want to know why? 
Because an eagle can soar higher than any other creature. And it can see further than any other bird of prey. And it can dive faster than any other bird of prey. And it is more regal than any other bird of prey. It was made to soar high. It was made to fight. It was never meant to just hang around in the chicken coops or the turkeys. Right? So how about you? Are you an eagle? Or are you a turkey? Let me be the first to tell you. You're eagles. You just got to stretch your wings out a little bit. And then you got to be willing to trust them. Right? Stand with me this morning. We're going to have the worship team come real quick. Like We're going to move into the Lord's Supper. I want you to hear this real quick like the other song. And then we're going to move into the Lord's Supper real quick like. Go ahead guys. Thank you.